I think we're all here and we are ready to start. And this is the second session of the Meet the Researchers series at UK House this year. We have four very exciting um, research papers to present to you. Um, my name is Latina Nikolova. I'll be the moderator for the panel. Um, in the end of the presentations, uh, we're hoping to get some questions going. So if you think of anything during the presentations, uh, please put them in the chat and um, I'll direct them to our presenters after they've completed um, their talks. Um, so first up, we have Miss Lydia Cholage from the University of Huddersfield. Um, Lydia is a graphic designer who explores the interdisciplinary relationship between graphic design and art. And today she's here to talk to us um, about her paper, The Mobius Strip. Lydia, please, would you like to join us on the stage? And I'll just... Thank you. Uh, I'll just quickly share my screen. Okay, so I'm hoping that you can all see that. <laughs> um, so, hi everyone, um, my name is Lydia. Um, I'm a researcher at the University of Huddersfield and I am going to be presenting you today with the Mobius Strip, uh, Traversing New Realities in Curatorial Design Through Collage and Surrealism. Um, so, my research aims are basically to further explore the limited research and relationship between surrealism and contemporary graphic design to reimagine contemporary female graphic designers within the realm of surrealism, and to establish an interdisciplinary theoretical framework, also known as the Mobius Strip analogy, based on surrealist techniques and methods that transgress conventional boundaries through new ways of approaching creative discourses. Um, so really, I kind of like to take it back to its roots. Um, and what is surrealism? Surrealism is a literary and artistic movement, and it is defined in the first manifesto of surrealism, written by founder André Breton, as psychic automatism in its pure state, by which one proposes to express the actual functioning of thought in the absence of any control, exercised by reason, exempt from any aesthetic or moral concern. Um, one of the only really main links to have been made between surrealism and graphic design um, actually comes from Rick Poyner, who is a British uh, curator and writer, critic, lecturer, etc. The list goes on. Um, but in 2010, uh, Poyner curated Uncanny Surrealism and Graphic Design um, at the Moravian Gallery in Czech Republic. Um, these are just a few images. So the images on the top left is actually an image taken from the exhibition entrance. Um, but this displayed work ranging from worldwide influential designers, such as Stefan Sagmeister, who you can see on the bottom left, um, MM Agency, who are to the right. Um, and one thing that I noticed whilst I was looking through it was the lack of women considered for this exhibition. Um, so why female surrealism? Why is it that I focused on this? Um, for most, surrealism is a movement associated with famous male artists such as Salvador Dali and Marcel Duchamp. Um, but in the last 10 years, there's been a growing interest in British curatorial engagement with female surrealist artists who were ignored in their time. A reimagining of their legacy is seen in many past and upcoming exhibitions, such as Angels of Anarchy at Manchester Art Gallery in 2009, Lee Miller and Surrealism at the Hepworth in 2018, Dorothea Tannin at Tate Modern in 2019 and Dora at Tate Modern in 2020, which I was going to go see, but unfortunately due to COVID, I couldn't. Um, so in reappraising the importance of women in the Surrealist oeuvre, as seen by Patricia Alma and Whitney Chadwick, a significant focus has been placed upon the role of 2D, 3D and more recently 4D collage as an unrivaled force for exploration of the unconscious. My PhD examines the importance of collage within the feminist surrealist legacy in spawning automatic processes that have been taken up and advanced by a number of contemporary female graphic designers, including Lola Dupre and Grazina Borosco, who I will introduce uh, in a few slides. Um, first, I'd like to kind of lay out what the Mobius strip analogy is. Um, and the first side of it, the first plane, is the analog plane. This plane 
originates from the traditional surrealist technique of automatic drawings. Automatic drawings are a means of unconscious practice that suppress conscious or rational control during the process of making. And the most famous traditional examples of these st stem from French artist André Masson. Uh, the second plane, which is the digital plane, um, considers a more modern and curative type of automatism. And this is introduced through new technological advances. And it is important to recognize that although that they exist on separate planes, this paper acknowledges their coexistence and how the combination of both introduces a new type of automatism, something that I am currently experimenting um, with the practice part of my PhD. The combination of these planes allow graphic design to traverse through alternate realities and explore the relationship of design with volume, compression, as well as digital space through 2D, 3D and 4D dimensions. Um, this is graphic designer Grazina Borosko. Uh, Borosko creates artworks in sets of three, and as she states, are a combination of images, drawings, and 3D components. Throughout her work, surrealist motifs are used, ranging from the eye to animal representations, to the combination of the object and the surreal, and more importantly, the utilization of the feminine body as a subject of beauty rather than an object of desire. Borosko navigates through a predominantly digital plane. And in these particular untitled images, the analog plane becomes an embellishment of the digital. By also utilizing textures, depth, and surrealist motifs, Borosco successfully transports the viewer to an alternate 3D reality, or better yet, her own surreality. Lola Dupre is a collage artist and illustrator who is currently based in Scotland. As you can see from the images on the screen, her work differs tremendously in style compared to Borosco. And I believe this to be a strong example of when the positioning of the Mobius strip analogy switches, whereby the digital plane becomes an embellishment of the analog. Despite this, in many of Dupre's pieces, she also demonstrates strong links with female surrealist tendencies. And this can be seen again through the animalistic representations, especially seen in the equine portraits, which are on the left, uh, sorry, on the right, and the reinvention of the soul series that use immediate surrealist signifiers. Furthermore, in the series Exploding, Dupre explores a 3D space through cut and paste techniques that was al also commissioned by PG2 Nike Basketball. It's interesting to consider the use of these techniques by a well-established brand such as Nike that is a clear display of surrealism's relevance to contemporary graphic design. Another contemporary female designer is Jessica Walsh, who recently broke away from Sagmeister and Walsh to form and Walsh. Walsh is pivotal to my research as she is an example of a female designer placing herself within her designs, where object becomes subject and intersubjectivity takes place. And this is further embellished by analog and digital planes. There are currently four uh, practice element parts to my PhD, um, and I've put, popped them in little separate um, titles so you can understand a little bit better what they're about. The first is a sigil making, and this is a creative play technique that is in homage to the links between surrealist women and witchcraft and alchemy. This uses predominantly analog process using acrylic pouring and a drawing tablet. The second part is more digital collage, and this is a visual response to my research on women surrealists. It traverses the Mobius strip through utilizing analog and digital techniques constantly. Uh, the third part is the processing. Um, I've actually created an, uh, an automatist surrealist collage generator uh, from code and it generates completely automatic collages based on some PNGs and um, some elements of collage that I've put in there. Um, the, and then the fourth part is the Cinema 4D. And this is really interesting to me because this is where um, it it considers the new impact of new technological advancements in 3D practice. And this is where the elements like texture, volume, material, um, and animation can be added to collage elements and to traverse the Mobius strip. Um, the first one is my sigils. So these play, as I've said, homage to witchcraft. And these were practiced by some female surrealists, uh, Remedy Osparo, Leonora Carrington, and Katie Horner, who were also branded the three wit witches. Um, these sigils were based on collision points within the English alphabet, um, and these are going to be formulate part of the processing collages, which you'll see in a minute. 
Um, these are some more, um, I guess, literal collage exper experimentations that I've done with digital um, Photoshop, Illustrator, or the usual software. Um, these are just using PNGs. And as you can see on the bottom, there's a little keyword that I gave myself, which was based on the research that I conducted uh, through the female surrealists. Um, processing. So this is the third part, and this is the collage generator that I was talking about. Um, so this is a completely automatic collage generator using HTML coding. Um, and as it's playing through, you'll just see it's completely random. So sometimes there'll be a mix of PNGs, random images. Um, those two eyes are separate images, and they actually appeared on the same one, which was really interesting. Um, we've got a pure sigil one there. And I'm really interested in the outcomes and um, where I can take these further. Stop. Um, these are just some outcomes uh, from the programs that I was experimenting with. So I've coded it so when I press the yes button, it saves whatever image is on the screen at the moment. Um, and what I'm hoping to do with these is to um, translate these in digital um, using Cinema 4D, which I've kind of started to begin. Um, and lastly, the Cinema 4D. Um, so this is a completely new software to me. Um, obviously, I've decided to pick my PhD at the best time to learn a new software, um, but here we are. And what I'm kind of doing at the moment is I began experimenting with surreal objects. I had a surreal object series, as you can see on the left, um, and I'm trying now to embed these within the collages. This is just a kind of really quick mock-up test and just a glitch effect that was completely not intentional, <laughs> unfortunately, but I ended up looking pretty nice. So I've just popped that in there. But as you can see, I'm really starting to think about material, um, application, depth, textures, etc. cetera. Um, this is one of the later tests that I've done. Um, this is a more refined, I guess, in terms of lighting and composition. But to me, there's almost an element of too clean, which makes me laugh when I say that. Um, but I like things to be a bit messy, as you probably uh, can see. Um, this is uh, playing around with cloth and again, textures, depth. I'm really playing around with space at the moment as well. That's something that I'm really interested in, in the curatorial aspect of uh, 3D space. Um, and again, this is just playing around with cloth. Here I was getting a little bit more comfortable, as you could probably tell. It's a little bit off, but we'll get there. Um, and this was kind of one of the later videos that I've done, and this plays around with um, the vertigo animation, also something that I'm adding to my collages um, to evoke space and just a little bit of displacement going on in the background there as well. Um, and where I am at the moment, uh, this is the last, the last thing. Um, so on some of the earlier collages that I showed you, the more digital ones, I'm wanting to convert them into the Cinema 4D, and this is me just playing around with that and starting to, um, to really get to grips with the software. Um, so yes, um, thank you for listening um, and thank you for the opportunity uh, for letting me present. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lydia, about this presentation. It's really interesting that um, sort of digital technology is sort of giving um, women agency to create on their own in these almost like new spaces, sort of otherworldly spaces, um, which is really uh, perhaps something that we need more of, ironically. Yeah, definitely. And especially in this time, what a great uh, time to do it in. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, we're still sort of stuck in our boxes in a way. Um, okay, so thank you very much, Lydia. Uh, next up is Dr. James Rendell uh, from the University of South Wales, uh, who will be talking um, on his uh, presentation, Throwing Digital Horns, COVID-19 and the Rise of Online Live Music Portal Shows. James, uh, if you could join us on stage, and then Lydia and I will leave and leave you to it. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is James Rendell. Uh, I'm a lecturer in creative industries at the University of South Wales. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about some recent research that I've been doing into the rise um, of live music performances as a response and contingency to the sort of cessation of, of public spaces being closed during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
so I'm just gonna oh, share my screen so hopefully you can see that somewhere uh, sorry uh, sorry just bear with me Hi, Jane. Can, can anyone see that? Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So, so as the image at the top of the slide indicates, during the COVID-19 pandemic and live events have been postponed or cancelled, musicians are turning to digital media and Web 2.0 platforms to perform live to fans around the world. But whereas the likes of Lady Gaga reside in the upper echelons of the music industry, that provides financial stability during the pandemic. My research is interested in the vast majority of musicians who find themselves in a more precarious position. So most musicians in the UK operate in the existing gig economy. Uh, this already places them in uncertain financial situations, relying on touring as a dominant source of income. As Emma Garland notes, the impact of the coronavirus outbreak on the independent music industry has been swift and devastating. Likewise, even when other public spaces are real, small to mid-sized venues can't as they cannot do gigs under social distancing. Resultantly, these compounding factors have meant that some venues have closed their doors permanently, such as the Deaf Institute and Gorilla, both in Manchester. Moreover, Paul Carr indicates that many freelancers in the music industry have been ineligible for pan-UK government support schemes and doubts their capacity to stay in the profession post-pandemic, with a recent poll by the Musicians' Union suggesting that 47% of musicians have been forced to look for work outside the music industry. However, as highlighted in opening slides, we have seen the rise in digital media live shows during the pandemic, what I term portal shows. So as the quote says there, portal shows are both live music events and screen media text where the portalization of shows are performed live to predominantly, if not entirely, online audiences across a digital threshold. This is facilitated by online streaming technologies curated alongside other media content that does not necessarily have to be live music. They can be uh, broadcast to a range of media hardware. Thus, looking at how independent bands have turned to portal shows offers real world digital solutions to the pandemic uh, cessation of face-to-face -face events. So to, conduct, um, so to conduct this research, I combined three interconnected approaches. Firstly, I employed textual analysis of the music performance that consists of the instrumentation, the vocals, uh, and the recording. This also considers the audience as performers who demonstrate fan identity through habitual language, actions, corporeal markers, and digital media affordances. Secondly, I nuanced Schreiber's utilization of visual analysis, text analysis, and platform analysis of online imagery to examine artists and audience cultural practices, platforms, technological affordances, and audio, visual, and written content produced. Finally, an economic analysis addressed the monetary strategies that stem from the online performances. So in doing so, I'll now show the three case studies before discussing my findings. Firstly, Code Orange's album release show for Underneath streamed on Twitch TV from the physical venue space, the Roxy Inn in Pittsburgh in the US. So this portal show used a professional media crew, resulting in a highly polished aesthetic where a multi-camera setup and editing mimics the pace of face-to-face -face shows. The show also used screen media devices to enhance certain elements of the gig. For example, several times the on-stage intermedial video screens uh, overlaid the stream performance, filling the computer screen entirely. This supports and heightens the aesthetic tone of the music and the band's performance and makes up for the lack of audience in the venue. Finally, the show is free to watch for audiences and free for the band to stream since Twitch TV's income stems from advertising revenue and subscription fees. Secondly, Brian Fallon's acoustic show on the website Stage It. Now, unlike the previous case study's professional aesthetic, the visual style of this show is more akin to a YouTube vlog whose authenticity is partially formed around distinctive modes of address to imagined audiences that encourages user interactivity. And we can kind of see that from the close visual proxemics of the image. 
On stage it, fans could pay what they can to attend, uh, with the minimum cost being five US dollars to reduce the transaction credit card cost. It was suggested that attendees pay um, 15 US dollars in line with the cost of small to mid-sized venues. And what's really interesting is that despite this being you know, an infinite digital space, stage it provides a limited number of tickets, much like a physical space. Finally then, um, Delta Sleep's Brighton in-store show, um, acoustic set on Instagram. This event was streamed live on Delta Sleep's and their record label Big Scary Monsters profiles via the platform's live video features. With this, audiences could freely watch the gig live or rewatch it for free for 24 hours via Instagram stories. Like the previous case study, this portal show had low production values, which married with the relaxed and informal nature of the performance. Since this was streamed by two different profiles, depending on which profile audiences view, the show will position them differently, much like face-to-face -face gigs offering situational variety. So here are some of my findings. So firstly, portal shows can expand what is considered pandemic media that usually centers on public health awareness and information and indeed misinformation. And in doing so, they provide different effective registers during times of fear, panic and anxiety habitually buttressed by traditional pandemic media. This supports previous studies that evidence how listening to music, even heavy aggressive genres, can produce positive mental states for fans. Portal shows um, also create spatial conflation of traditional venues that remove some of the practices, such as dancing, whilst providing audience intimacy through the close proxemics of the camera positions. Unlike traditional gigs, where you would need to be at the front um, of the, you know, near the stage for such effective closeness. With the Code Orange show, it even provided viewing positions not typically fostered at face-to-face -face events, uh, such as viewing from the side or back of the stage. Now the technological affordances, um, as we can see from the image on the right, such as chat functions, allow audiences to interact with one another and perform fan identity through digital lexicon, such as using emojis, such as the horn symbol. Thus, there's still audience participation and interaction that adds to the experience and supports music scenes. Finally, shows are streamed live and frequently um, only archived for a limited period or not at all, creating a temporally bound experience much like traditional shows. This creates exclusivity that produces subcultural capital for attendees, where individuals gain a special kudos for having been there, to quote Cronenberg. Thus, value for audience stems from these shows novelty, but also that they're closed events, exemplified by stage only providing a limited number of tickets and not recording the performances. Now with this then, we see several strengths and limitations of portal shows that you know, artists could take forward thinking about the pandemic and beyond. So what are these strengths and limitations of portal shows for musicians, the music industry and the creative industry at large? Well, firstly, portal shows allow fans from around the world to watch a gig together. Audiences can respond in real time to the event's intimacy, spontaneity, and spectacle with others via the site's intermediate chat room affordances, engaging in what Matt Hills terms just in time fan engagement. As such, portal shows are far more inclusive than traditional shows, um, especially if we think about, for example, um, fans who might have a physical disability, um, where a traditional venue may not be readily um, equipped to deal with um, particular demographics and their special needs. Um, the inclusivity and interactivity of these events are vital to music scenes. Likewise, thanks to the cheapness of digital media, mobile technology and Web 2.0 facilities, portal shows can be performed in venues or alternative spaces. So they can provide income for live venues and or artists. Uh, we've seen a whole host of, of bands and musicians you know, playing gigs you know, in their kitchens, for example, which is a sort of novel space and provides that intimacy that fans really love. Moreover, portal shows engender opportunities for further commercial output, such as exclusive merchandise for those novel shows and can encourage audiences to consume artists and bands back catalogues of music, as we can see from the images here on the bottom right. Furthermore, whilst the research focuses on live music, portal shows are also salient alternatives to other live media hampered by the pandemic such as stand-up comedy and theater. That said, whilst portal shows rely on existing fan base, uh, thus they might be difficult, uh, a difficult performance context for new or emerging artists. 
Likewise, it cannot support audiences who do not have access to internet facilitated hardware and web connections, um, which might be exacerbated by the financial hardship that we've seen because of the pandemic. Nevertheless, it's my argument that portal shows that are novel in their difference from traditional live shows, but also as my presentation indicates, are also highly varied online events, can offer a potential lifeline for live media events during the pandemic and beyond. Uh, thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much, James. Um, I think there's already a question for you in the chat box. Um, but um, I was also sort of thinking because um, obviously you listed the strengths and the limitations of these um, shows in great detail and we keep hearing how um, you know the sort of the gig business and the music business currently especially with independent and younger artists is struggling right now um, do you feel there is uh, because obviously you spoke very eloquently about all of the um, you know the advantages of these uh, performances but do you feel there is any longevity in this type of performance beyond the current situation um i think there is i mean since um the re since i've been conducted the research over the summer mm. it's been a a, um, a tactic that's been used by um, a range of different uh, institutions so for example at the University of South Wales, where I work, they did an all-day portal show for the students who are who are studying music to be able to perform. So, actually, there I think on the one hand, the the majority of the shows that we're seeing are portal shows tend to be existing fan uh, bands, and a number of them are doing sort of um, almost nostalgic shows, like playing out an entire album or an anniversary show, or getting back together to play a one-off show, which naturally pulls bands in because of the exclusivity and stuff. Um, which some bands even seem to perform, you know, bands that are not always touring regularly seems like an, a, a good alternative. But there are perhaps spaces where um, younger bands, newer bands are, are finding a space. Um, and perhaps if, there, if there's the approach of adopting the similar model where, you know, the, the support bands that you'd normally find at a gig tend to be um, more fledgling compared to the more established bands, that if that comes into play, that might facilitate you know, newer bands. Um, but I think, I think portal shows are definitely, um, I mean, portal shows were around before the pandemic anyway. Um, Coachella was doing them and a few other places. And I think the, 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 the ease of them, um, particularly through things like Instagram stories, I think there's a place for them. Um, I think people do miss real shows as well. Um, but I think there, there. I think that the the longevity of them will will be sustained in some contexts. Okay, that's well. That's good to hear that because then there's obviously options. Yeah, and I think the novelty and creativity that come with them. So uh, Martina mentioned um, sort of virtual po portals, and, and so part of my subsequent research is looking at sort of avatar spaces, so things like Minecraft and Fortnite, where bands have used a kind of video video game space. Um, and uh, to perform live music and then uh, um, the or attendees are kind of um, other characters in the show. So I think the novelty of these kind of events is also quite intriguing for people. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot going on with it. I, I feel like I'm just kind of scratching the surface of this. Well, that's great. That's very exciting. Um, I think there's lots of love for your research in the chat box. So I'll leave you to um, address some of the comments while I present our um, Simona Mani. Thank you very much, James. Thank you very Thank much you. for sharing your research with us. Uh, so next up we have Simona Mani from the University of York. And Simona is a participatory filmmaker who's worked as a practitioner with a wide range of groups, including asylum seekers, people in recovery from mental health problems, homeless young people and care home residents. Um, Simone is going to talk uh, about her project Stepping Through Interactive. Uh, Simone, would you like to join us on stage? Yeah, there she is. And I'll vanish magically. Hello. Hi, um, I'm just going to share my screen, hoping that it will work okay. Yep, I hope you can see it. And yes, through this presentation, I'll be talking about Stepping Through Interactive, which is an interactive film that emerged from my PhD research. I'm based at the Digital Creativity Labs, and I'm now at the very end of my PhD. 
I'll just describe the film briefly and then I'll talk a bit more about why we made it, how and how it looks like now. But Stepping Through uh, is an interactive film about mental health and it was produced directly by four participants with lived experience of mental health problems. In the film, they discuss what helped them in recovery and what hindered recovery for them, especially looking at isolation and community. Um, it's a video poetry film, so it contains um, imagery and poetry um, around individual themes and communal themes. So things that apply to only one participant and things that apply to the entire group. Viewers can move through this content by um, checking in with their own feelings. So um, they are presented with some material and then at intervals they are asked to check in on how they feel. Um, they select uh, a feeling from a list and then they are presented with more content that's emotionally attuned uh, to how they feel in the moment. And the reason to structure the film this way is to encourage empathy and self-reflection in viewers uh, with a view, of course, of decreasing stigma and mental health and sort of reflecting on the fact that the emotional well-being that was compromised at times for participants in this project um, is actually something that we all experience uh, in real life in daily life and so encourage uh, an empathetic re re relationship with the participants. It was assembled using Cutting Room, which is an object-based media authoring tool developed in the same labs uh, at the University of York. And I think there is a, there has been a talk in previous days about Cutting Room as a tool for anyone that's interested. It should be recorded somewhere. And um, the reason to undertake this research was based on my practice. So I've been a participatory filmmaker uh, for um, a, around 10 years now, and I work with different communities and very often we discuss mental health and emotional well-being. In this approach, uh, just in case you haven't come across before, um, what happens is that uh, um, filmmakers don't make a documentary about people, but it's actually the people themselves, community member or um, someone that has experienced the issue firsthand that are facilitated in producing their own films. So the role of the filmmaker is to pass on skills and to support the production of um, creative materials, which is the direct expression of the participant's viewpoint. This is particularly powerful for addressing issues that are uh, often um, misconceived in mainstream media. and. When, in this case, mental health, it applies really well to this field. Um, in my practice, though, I've often noticed that it can be a struggle sometimes to accommodate many different voices within a linear film form. In uh, participatory filmmaking, every participant is supposed to be an author, so we don't have a hierarchy. Uh, everyone should have an equal voice in the film, and uh, it's often difficult to uh, make sure that every viewpoint is represented. So what I did with my PhD was exploring whether uh, the narrative non-linearity, which is afforded by interactive media, could produce more spacious film, uh, re films that are really polyphonic, where many voices can coexist. In order to do that, we work through three different phases. Um, so we gathered these participants together, who are people that I had already worked with in 2016, before my PhD and uh, they had already produced a film called Stepping Through, so we kept the same title. And um, it was a short film, traditional short film of around seven minutes, where they discussed isolation and community and how it felt for them uh, to join a supportive community during recovery. So it's more or less the same theme. And uh, what we did, the research, was to really break down, deconstruct the existing film um, check if anything was left unsaid by looking at symbolic images, arranging them in different orders and doing uh, self-reflective exercises. And what we found was that participants felt um, a sort of unspoken pressure to represent in the film what they knew they had in common with the other participants. Uh, they all knew each other because they all belong from the same community and they decided to um, to discuss what they knew they had in common and they sort of left out their unique viewpoint in a sense. And um, we also found other expressive needs that were unfulfilled in the film. They were only sort of hinted at. Based on this, we designed a new narrative form, first on paper and then um, digitally, of course. 
And in this uh, nonlinear structure, which is quite complicated, as you can see, uh, there is the original film broken down and interspersed with new content. And all these bits of content are linked by theme, by participants, by feelings. So there is a very um, complex structure here. And we also went on filming the new content with the participants, and then we assembled the room, uh, the, the film, sorry, with cutting room, which is uh, thanks to the support of software en engineers in my labs. And now that we have a working prototype, we are evaluating the film with a number of audiences. First of all, with the same participants that have reflected on their work, and also with um, members of the community of belong, with the community they belong in, and uh, a number of other um, professionals and service users in other mental health organizations. And finally, uh, a sample of general audience who may have uh, varying degrees of awareness in mental health. So we went from familiar audiences to wider, gradually wider audiences to see whether the aim of the film was reached, um, which was for participants to encourage self-reflection, to, to provide support for people who are currently struggling with mental health problems, and, and to reduce stigma on mental health. And I'll just briefly describe some of the features of the film. Um, so we, as I said, we have the original film and it's interspersed with new content. Um, every so often, the, the viewer uh, is presented with a filming menu, and they are able to choose between different menu, different feelings according to how uh, they responded to what they watched. And based on that, they are presented with content that is relevant uh, to their emotional state. Um, we have a coexistence of video poetry, but also some input in documentary talking head form, where participants share directly their story talking on camera. And that's unlocked once uh, the journey is at a level where we can pair uh, the viewer with uh, a par particular participant based on commonalities of feelings. And um, at the end of the journey, the viewer also gets a, a clip that's personalized on them according to the feelings they have been through. Uh, so the software in the film assembles this clip and producing a review of those feelings with music, um, spoken word, and symbolic imagery. And this is meant to be um, a contribution from the viewer in the body of the film, if it makes sense. And uh, there is also the possibility of sitting back and not interacting with any menu. Um, that's for people that might prefer not to be so active in the viewing experience. So if you are presented with a menu and you don't press anything, the film doesn't get stuck, but the menu carries on into a new clip and the film assembles itself uh, in a version that is much closer to the original short film we started with. The menus are also created as if they were um, a short film themselves. So you don't get a static menu that interrupts the viewing flow, but it's rather like a short film in itself with music and moving image. And so even the menu keep the kind of cinematic feel of the rest uh, of the film. And here I, start, I try to represent visually how expanding the uh, narrative form from linear to this sort of three-dimensional shape also meant that the representation of the issue became a lot more complex. In the um, starting film, uh, the short film Linear, we had a bit of a dichotomy between isolation as corresponding to mental illness and community corresponding to well-being, which is, of course, correct. And the last year, I mean, we're all aware of this now. Uh, we've been forced to acknowledge this, so it's absolutely not, not untrue. But we found by expanding the film that this uh, subject is a lot more complex for, for these participants, for some, being in the wrong crowd can actually feel more lonely than being alone, of course. Uh, for others, uh, isolation sometimes is useful for self-reflection. So things are not so black and white. And sometimes I was asked uh, sensibly, what if we had just made a longer film? So if we had uh, made a much longer film, like a feature documentary, inserting all these aspects, wouldn't it have been the same and maybe even simpler? And on a quantitative level, yes, but what we, we tried to do was not to simply increase the running time of the film, but to really create a new narrative shape, um, which in a way it develops in space, not just in time. 
and by the fin being able to rearrange itself according to the viewer, we are trying to create a completely different viewing experience than just watching a longer film. So this is a film that responds, in a sense, to the emotional um, well-being, to the emotional uh, awareness of the viewer. And finally, this is a link, tinyurl.com, a slash stepping through one to find um, a bit more information. There is a paper and other things there. And uh, or feel free to email me. At the moment, the film is only available through the evaluation study, but it will be soon released um, you know, to the public in general. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simona, for this presentation. This is really interesting. Um, I mean, you spoke a little bit about some of the challenges um, when you invited uh, people to share their experiences. But I'm interested to know um, whether you encountered any, cha I mean, have you ever, sh have you shared any of this footage yet? Or is, are you going to present it as a finished um, sort of film? We thought of presenting some footage, but when, and participants are really excited and keen to get the film out there. But at the end, we decided to just keep it as a whole. Um, there is the existing previous film that uh, it's publicly available, but we decided to keep it as a whole because we like to see how people respond to that certain alternation of content. So we don't want to give away um, bits of content beforehand, if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And did you, because obviously these are some very sensitive topics, which are, which is why they're so important to talk about. I mean, we are all aware of these uh, concepts um, and we are not even talking about them enough. Um, but did you sort of think of, I mean, how did you approach this type of research from an ethical perspective? Did you encounter any obstacles? There could have been, and in my practice, for instance, we often filmed with people for uh, to keep them anonymous just by using um, symbolic imagery, hands, objects, flowers, nature, etc. But in this case, participants were really keen to be publicly uh, visible. Um, most of them are actors as well, and they are um, activists in the mental health field, so they are already publicly known. And so they really want and the, the images that you saw there, I, those are the participants themselves. And they, they were really keen to act in the film and being seen. And so it, it was a bit tricky at first um, on, the, on an ethical perspective. But once we acknowledged that that was their uh, creative wish and by um, not showing participants, we were actually restricting their, their, their expression. Uh, we were not protecting them then um, things went quite well. And it would have been probably different with participants that are not so publicly active um, in mental health in, and in creative work. So it all depends on the needs and what's best for, for the participants. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's really interesting. Um, thank you very much for sharing um, your research and uh, please do keep us up to date with the progress. I see there are some questions popping up for you in the chat as well. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm going to introduce uh, our last but definitely not least um, speaker, uh, Mr. Tom, uh, Mr. Rob Eagle uh, from the uh, University of West of England, Bristol, where he is a practice based PhD researcher. He's going to talk to us um, about augmented reality headsets for emplaced storytelling. Um, Rob, would you please join us on stage? And um, I know that at one point I'm um, going to share a video for you. So if you just give me the cue and I'll uh, fire up my screen share. Okay. It seems I might I might have sorted that. I added it on, on YouTube, so <laughs> we can see. Well, whichever works best. Okay. If, if, if we have any problems, I'll ask you to come to my rescue. So yes, um, I am a practice-based PhD researcher um, at the Digital Cultures Research Center at uh, in UWE Bristol. So I um, uh, my PhD has been looking at how to use AR headsets for in-place storytelling. Now, not everyone might know what headset-based AR 
is. Um, so here's a, here's a photo of, of someone wearing the HoloLens. Um, I've specialized mainly in the HoloLens just because it was it was easier for, for development, um, but there's also the Magic Leap. Um, and on the horizon, there are some other AR glasses, goggles, um, different types of, of headgear um, coming out in the next year or two, um, particularly from all the big tech corporations, uh, Apple, Facebook. Um, so they're all kind of teasing um, what sort of AR devices, wearable devices they have coming out in the, in the near future. So that was part of why I, I started shifting to uh, to AR from uh, from VR. I saw that there's there's a lot of potential um, for um, kind of growth in the uptake of this, and and I feel like we need to um, look at how we can use AR, um, particularly on uh, in in glasses, optic AR, uh, for storytelling. Now I uh, started as a as a filmmaker, and I worked in audio installations. And you know, with uh, traditional media, um, linear 2D media, photography, TV, you know, the story is the content. Um, it's what you see on the screen. It's what you hear through the speakers. Um, whereas with uh, spatial media, uh, like um, like this, these AR headsets, um, it's uh, you have to bring in all these different lessons from uh, from traditional media, but also from theater, from fine art. So the story is more than just the content, it's also about the space. So that gives us a few challenges for how do we frame this and how do we understand this. Um, and there's not a whole lot of literature out there uh, outside of, um, say, psychology and, and human computer interaction um, on, uh, on AR, particularly on, on, on these headsets. So I started looking uh, around at, at uh, what a few theorists have, have written. William Maricchio, um, he's writing uh, at the moment, he's doing a study on VR and narrative coherence. Um, it's this idea of finding the narrative as you're in a VR headset. Um, and and the, the idea that the audience are piecing together meaning of an experience between the visuals, uh, the audio, and the haptics or other elements. Um, so there's this inherent creativity um, that goes on with the audience where they're filling in the gaps in order to make these connections. So that that's proved quite interesting for me to look at in my research, but I'm also looking at how we feel our way through the narrative, an actual physical way. And through that, the, um, the idea of emplacement from anthropologist David Howes has been useful. Um, with a lot of VR, uh, traditionally we look at embodiment, this relationship between the mind and the body. Um, but David Howes uh, is looking generally at this idea of emplacement where it's mind, body, and environment. So it's this third element. And I think that's also what can help us to understand uh, these AR headsets and their use for storytelling. Because it's not just about the mind and the body in AR, it's also the world around you, the physical world, including physical objects. So my main uh, practice-based uh, research project um, has been through the wardrobe. Um, I'm just now finishing my PhD, um, writing up, um, so I'm, I'm actually kind of proofreading um, and making corrections on my thesis at the moment. Um, so my practice is done, um, uh, but we've taken this, uh, we've toured it around a bit. Um, it presents the uh, voices of four people from Bristol who are non-binary, agender, uh, genderqueer, and uh, helps to tell their stories, um, bits of their stories through their clothes. Um, so I'll kind of I'll give you a, a little a short teaser so you have an idea of what it looks like and what it feels like because as I said this is a spatial medium um, so the video can hopefully show you what it looks like in space a bit. Okay, of course it's gone wrong. <laughs> would you mind? Would you mind playing for me, please? Yeah, on your end, thanks. I think I've always known that I was not male. I don't have to wear a skirt to be non-binary. I guess it's kind of a really empowering way to look after yourself. So I know my identity, but my expression is very fluid looking in the mirror and feeling like that's still the same person. Such an affirming feeling for me. It 
yes, this is who I am, and you can't shut me down. Okay, great. Um, so we uh, we developed this uh, this installation over a number of iterations. So this was the first kind of play testing uh, that we did in November 2018. Um, and that was us really trying to figure out um, what um, we, what we could do with objects in the environment. Um, and we realized through all the audience feedback. So a lot of this this research is based on uh, on in-depth audience feedback, um, asking people um, uh, how did how did you engage with the tech? Um, what did you what did you see? What did you hear? What did you touch? Um, and what did it feel like for you um, to simultaneously navigate a physical world and a digital augmented layer? Um, and so through that, uh, we were able to, to actually make the physical more important. Um, one of the benefits of using an AR headset like this is that you can see your own body, you can see the real world. Um, and that was a frustration that I had had with, with VR, that I wanted, I wanted my, my audience to be able to, to see themselves and to, to see the, the physical world and to be able to touch objects. Um, so that was where we, we, we bulked that up for the next iteration. Um, this was the, the, full, the full prototype um, at Sheffield Dockfest in 2019. Um, and we then took audience feedback from that for the next iteration took it to home in Manchester. Um, so there it is in, in a gallery space um, with, with kind of nice lighting um, spaced out a bit more. And then we took it to a, an abandoned shop um, in an arcade in Amsterdam. This was part of IDFA 2019. Um, and that was interesting because half of our audience um, were actually just walking in off the street. So we're not talking about your usual gallery goers or your usual film festival goers. Um, this was the public who just stumbled across it um, and were in intrigued by these clothes in the window. And this was the last iteration that we did in the UK. Um, that's this is in the, uh, the Barbican Center in London. So, in understanding uh, the importance of a physical space with AR, um, I came across the theory of third space uh, from Edward Soja. For a Soja, first space um, is this idea of of this lived space, the physical physical space that we can see and touch. Second space is the world of uh, of imagination, of representation, um, such as media and art. And third space is where the material and the uh, imaginary and the representational come together. Um, and so, for understanding something like AR, this has proved quite useful. Um, this is a, a hybrid space, uh, as Nicola Liberati calls it, um, looking at a phenomenology of, of AR, is this, this blended sense of, of, of presence in the physical and the virtual. Here's a little um, diagram of it. Um, this idea that um, you can't, the technology depends on the activation of the person, and of course that, that depends on the physical space. So it's sort of this, this triad, this triangle, um, that all three uh, depend on and relate to each other. Um, this was the latest version of it in Beijing at the Goethe Institute. So what I learned, uh, I'll give you a few of the kind of the top line lessons um, from all of this. Um, of course, in placement, um, not just embodiment for understanding this trilectic relationship um, and general design principles um, for how we can use these headsets. Um, so spatial audio. Um, kind of representing the physics of audio in the real world, in the physical world, learning from architecture and sculpture. So thinking of AR more as, as kinetic sculpture uh, and thinking spatially um, rather than you know, flat. Uh, harnessing multisensory stimuli. Um, so this can reduce some of the emphasis on visuals. We don't have to build a full virtual world. Um, using object recognition and spatial or gaze activation. Um, and this, this helps for the, the audience being able to navigate their way through it, using it as a menu. Minimal text, which is ironic on a slide full of text. Um, embracing the abstract and lo-fi visual, visuals because uh, these headsets can't deal with the most kind of high fidelity uh, animations. Um, so at this point, it's a matter of really kind of uh, lower poly count uh, animations. And applying methods from uh, radio, immersive theater, uh, for uh, world building and story creation. 
Um, uh, another big part of this has been uh, incorporating the people um, who, who gave their stories, incorporating them in the design process. Um, and I found uh, inspiration from um, models of co-creation. Um, there's a good example from MIT, from the co-creation studio. And more generally thinking of, of how do we incorporate user feedback into the navigation and story design, particularly for accessibility, um, through long-term studies with, with our audience. Um, and there's the work there of uh, Sasha Costanza Chok um, on design justice. Um, so I'd highly recommend um, checking that out. So there we are. Um, there's my Twitter, and there's also the Twitter and the website uh, for, uh, for Through the Wardrobe. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so very much, uh, Rob, for this presentation. I particularly love um, this definition of material and mental spaces as uh, sort of a description of AR. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that you've shown, um, so, so you've showcased some of the project already. Can you please tell us a little bit about um, sort of the, the feedback or the kind of reception you've received? Um, it's interesting, even from the first iteration, um, people said um, they had this um, a feeling of safety that they don't necessarily get in VR. And that's one of those things that I think there are a lot of hopes um, for AR that are for, for VR in, in particular that, you know, VR can can transport you to a different world, but it also can make the wearer feel quite vulnerable. Um, and I think not everyone is um, feels comfortable um, in VR when you're completely uh, feeling disembodied. Um, and so I think for me, having an AR headset helps, particularly for, for people who aren't so keen to put on a VR headset. They can see their bodies, they can see the environment, and it helps them to actually relax a bit more. Um, so yeah, I think that was the first bit of, of feedback that really helped to kind of um, help me to embrace the physical and the multi-sensory stimuli um, as much as a 3D animation, and really to kind of make sure that the that the technology sort of melts away and deprioritize the technology. So using the technology just for the storytelling bits, for the audio, um, but really not trying to uh, center uh, the experience around the headset. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember from your poster as well, um, I think you spoke about um, that this sort of storytelling is not just about the visual, but it's also other elements. Mm. Um, so how did you, how did you sort of t tell us a little bit about that journey? How did you actually discover and experiment with these elements? Um, I think, well, I think part of it was just learning through VR first, the fact that you could be, you know, transported off to a different planet and you could smell burnt toast at the same time. So I thought, well, you know, sp smell can be quite, quite powerful. Um, so why don't we bring that into this and actually make that a, a key component? Um, so yeah, really thinking through, um, so each each item of clothing has a scent related to that person. Um, so you, you kind of, before you even, even put it on, before you even engage with, with the clothing in that, you're kind of, uh, you have a sense of texture, of smell. I think the only thing we don't use is, uh, is taste. Um, but you know, th this idea of, of using these objects as well as the headset within, within a space. Um, so yeah, I think it was, it was a matter of thinking through those different elements and having iterations because we had a lot of time to be able to, to use or test this over 2018 and 19, which I think is a great luxury that a lot of people out there, you know, putting on, um, exhibitions don't necessarily have. Indeed, indeed. Um, I see already uh, there's a couple of comments. Um, Lydia is saying that such a that this is such a strong theoretical component and powerful practice. Some 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 nice praise. And then uh, Tom is saying um, that he really likes your extension of Sawyer's model. Um, so obviously this is uh, making contributions uh, as well as being sort of opening up worlds be it not entirely sort of sort of on the liminal space between you know the physical and the mm -hmm. digital mm -hmm. um fantastic thank you so very much um i think with only two minutes uh, until the end of the session i think we're going to wrap it up here um i think we should all sort of join hands in saying thank you to all of our researchers who presented today um you can have a look at their posters um on the audience of the future live website uh, i'm sure that they'll be more than happy for you all to get in touch um should you want to collaborate or talk to them a little bit more about their research 
Um, so if all of the uh, realtors would like to just join me on stage so for a final wave, um, there's James and Lydia and Simona. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so very much. This was Meet the Researchers Session 2 at UK House 2021 South by Southwest. Thank you so very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.